Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Bradley Lectures podcast. I'm Tal Fortgang. We've got a fascinating lecture to explore today. Harvard University psychologist Steven Pinker on The Blank Slate, The Modern Denial of Human Nature. While as a Princeton man, I normally scoff at anything associated with Harvard, I really enjoyed the difficult practical, moral, and political questions raised by this lecture. So I wanted to bring on a guest who is passionate about many of the same issues, human difference, human similarity, and their relations to human rights and our political and pre-political institutions. That's why I'm joined today by Will Baird, a colleague of mine at the American Enterprise Institute, where he does research primarily on tech policy, but also serves as our resident skeptic, sometimes neuroscientist, and asker of discomforting questions. Will, thank you for joining us on the Bradley Lectures podcast. Thank you, Tull. You're wonderful. Uh, thanks for, for saying that. Uh, I, I actually coerced Will into, into saying that off mic. Okay, Will, uh, can you give us a bit of your, your background and how you got interested in these, these sorts of issues in the Steven Pinker world? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I think I've always been a very broad reader and as someone who uh, enjoys reading philosophically inclined works, um, you know, the question of human nature, where does it come from, kind of touches on all aspects of philosophy, history, economics. And, you know, one one thing I'm very interested in is theory, but it's also at some point theory is uh, has to be testable. You know, where does the rubber meet the road? And Pinker covers a lot of this, uh, and I think it provides a lot of valuable insight into basically any topic of interest to someone who is interested in, in sort of the liberal arts education. So before we get into the content of what uh, Pinker says and, and analyzing it and uh, – and even being critical, we're going to have to go over his basic thesis. So can you sketch out for our audience very briefly uh, the way you see his typology and whether you think it's uh, comprehensive or maybe too reductive or maybe too simplistic? Sure. Um, so he, in this talk, he sketches out three basic theories or um, kind of big picture explanations of human nature. Uh, the first is the blank slate. So basically, uh, man is born as a blank slate. And everything that he is is written onto him through his life experiences, what's taught to him, how he's socialized. The second is the ghost of the machine, which is basically you can think of as, as dualism, where you have the body and the body has some relationship to the mind, but the mind is still separate. And I think Pinker doesn't do a great job in this talk of distinguishing between the ghost of the machine and the blank slate. But I think that's also partly because many people who kind of put forth the dualist view um, end up kind of falling back on sort of blank slate arguments. And the third is kind of the um, biological explanation, which uh, some people call it biological determinism. That's not really an accurate, and, and Pinker pushes back against this, but doesn't really explain why so much in detail. But really, it's, I think it's more biological probabilism, where knowing um, about the biological roots of human behavior and human psychology, we can say with a certain degree of certainty that certain things are more or less likely to happen, so Pinker is a cognitive psychologist. He's a scientist who's interested in science, and a lot of what he talks about is basically a literature review of the scientific evidence. But since I'm interested primarily in politics, and I was a politics major in college, and I always like to pull things onto my home turf, I'm just going to immediately uh, pull Pinker into my comfort zone and ask the, about the political ramifications of uh, the way he sketches out different models of human nature. He notes that people on the left and right have been critical uh, of the science, the science and the scientific conclusions of scientists like him. But who ought to celebrate? Who, aside from those who are simply committed to scientific pursuits, ought to hear his lecture and give him three full cheers? Uh, so I think that people across, you know, the entire political spectrum, but broad swaths of the spectrum uh, can find things to like in here. Uh, there's always a fuzzy distinction between is and ought. And uh, we have to, at some point, derive ought from what we know about the world around us. But I think, you know, people on the left uh, will generally, you know, you can you can read a lot of what Pinker is saying and say, you know, people are not fully responsible for where they end up in life. And therefore, we need to be helping them. Um, we need to be giving them a leg up when they're just maybe not capable of providing them for themselves, for example. Um, and, you know, people on the right can say, yeah, you know, that's all nice, but at a certain point, there's also so much, only so much that we can do to help people. You know, some people are only, maybe only going to be able to get a up to a high school education and college won't do that much more for them. Some people might have other things. Um, you know, if you have psychological issues, you can only do so much to help those. People who are very dogmatic about their view of human nature uh, will find it challenging. So I want to ask one more question before we break 
for the lecture. Uh, and that is about the idea of the noble savage. It's a Rousseauian idea. I think that's the way most people educated in, in the liberal tradition uh, kind of associate it. Pinker rejects it. He, he doesn't like the idea of the noble savage. And yet the idea seems to persist in certain ways uh, that we might talk about other cultures or uh, – other lifestyles. Other lifestyle. Well, maybe other lifestyles. I would say, in uh, in a certain uh, disparagement of Western civilization, sometimes the noble savage is idealized. So, how do you see that persisting? And what are the major questions that the idea of the noble savage might raise for you? Yeah. So, I mean, I think in terms of why it is so persistent, I think we ultimately come from nature. I think we like to think that we come like our heritage is is good. Um, we are often dissatisfied with the present. So I think the combined um, kind of rose-colored glasses looking at the past and then kind of the naturalist fallacy often makes people believe or assume that things used to be much better. I think often just in the media, kind of more primitive lifestyles can be romanticized. I think that contributes to it. But, you know, it does it does raise interesting questions because even, even if there were a totally, you know, peaceful, noble beginnings, uh, we had to get here from there. And so the question becomes, uh, if, we're, if we're blank slates, as you know, Rousseau believed, what happened? What, who was the first person to etch on the slate to create the non-noble modern? Uh, who, was, who was the untaught teacher who got all this decay in human interaction moving? Um, and I don't, I don't think that Rousseau or anyone else uh, on kind of the side of blank slatist really has a good, good answer for that. It would be nice if we can go and identify that figure from human history who set us down this ignoble path, uh, the prime mover. Uh, who ruined man's noble, savage uh, character. Will and I are going to go look for such a figure, and we will leave you to listen to Steven Pinker's lecture, The Blank Slate, The Modern Denial of Human Nature. We'll be back in just a few minutes. Everyone needs a theory of human nature. Everyone has to anticipate the behavior of others, and that means we all need theories, tacit or explicit, about what makes people tick. So much depends on our theory of human nature. We use our conceptions of human nature to manage our relationships, to bring up our children, to control our own behavior. The assumptions uh, about learning in our theory of human nature guide our policies in education. Its assumptions about motivation guide our policies in law and government. And because a theory of human nature delineates what we can achieve easily, what we can achieve only with sacrifice or pain, and what we cannot achieve at all, it affects our values, what we think we can reasonably strive for as individuals and as a society. It's no surprise, then, that for millennia, theories of human nature were tied up in religion. And indeed, the Judeo-Christian uh, theory of uh, human life, as it evolved over centuries, has commitments about what we would today consider to be the subject matter of psychology and biology. For example, in the Judeo-Christian theory, the mind is a system with a number of faculties, such as a capacity for love, a moral sense that presents us with standards of right and wrong, and an ability to make choices, which is free in the sense that it isn't uh, subject to the laws of cause and effect. Uh, we have free will. Uh, but it has an innate tendency to choose sin. Now, today, no scientifically literate person can believe that the events narrated in Genesis literally took place. And as a result, uh, there's been a need for a different grounding of human nature. And with the decline of fundamentalism, I think that modern intellectual life tacitly committed itself to three doctrines, each of them associated with a dead white male. Uh, the first is the blank slate, or the tabula rasa, commonly associated with John Locke, although a uh, search of his writings, which is now easy to do because they're all on the internet, uh, shows that he actually never used the expression blank slate. But here's what he did write. He said, let us suppose the mind to be, as we say, white paper, void of all characters without any ideas. How comes it to be furnished? Whence comes it by that vast store which the busy and boundless fancy of man has painted on it with an almost endless variety? Now, the blank slate uh, is a doctrine with a great deal of moral and political appeal. 
In Locke's time, it implied that dogmas, such as the divine right of kings, were not self-evident truths implanted into our brains, but rather they had to be justified by experiences that people shared and therefore could debate. It undermines a hereditary royalty and aristocracy who could claim no more uh, grounds for virtue and wisdom if their minds started out as blank as everyone else's. And by the same token, it undermined the institution of slavery because slaves could no longer be held to be innately inferior or subservient. Now, we continue to see an influence of the blank slate in modern intellectual life and sometimes in unexpected places. Psychology, for most of the 20th century, tried to explain all human behavior through a few simple mechanisms of association uh, and conditioning. The social sciences try to explain all cultural and social patterns through uh, the idea of socialization and culture as an autonomous force. There's a second doctrine that often accompanies the blank slate, which uh, comes from, uh, whose name comes from a poem by John Dryden called The Conquest of Grenada. I am as free as nature first made man, ere the base laws of servitude began, when wild in woods the noble savage ran. Now, the noble savage is more commonly attributed to this man, the French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. The example of the savages seems to confirm that mankind was formed ever to remain in this condition, that it is the real youth of the world, and that all ulterior improvements have been so many steps in appearance towards the perfection of individuals, but in fact towards the decrepitness of the species. Now, there's a great deal of appeal to the doctrine of the noble savage, which Rousseau used to oppose Hobbes. If, uh, in a state of nature, we are naturally peaceable, then there's no need for a domineering leviathan, a government and police force, to keep us uh, from each other's throats. If we're basically nasty, then conflict is a permanent part of the human condition. Whereas if we're basically noble, we can work for a utopian society of the future. Children are born savages, so if the inner savage in us is nasty, then child-rearing must be an arena of discipline and conflict. Whereas if the savage in us is basically noble, then child-rearing consists of providing children with opportunities to develop their potential. Like the blank slate, the noble savage has had a widespread influence in modern intellectual life. We see it in the respect for everything natural and the distrust of anything man-made. Natural pharmaceuticals, natural foods, natural yogurt, natural childbirth, and so on. We see it uh, in the understanding of social problems as repairable defects in our institutions as opposed to a more traditional view in which they would be seen as part of the inherent tragedy of the human condition. And there's a third doctrine that uh, goes along with the noble savage and the blank slate, commonly associated with the philosopher René Descartes. Descartes wrote, When I consider my mind, I cannot distinguish any parts, but apprehend it to be clearly one and entire. The faculties of willing, conceiving, etc. cannot be said to be its parts, for it is one the same mind which employs itself in willing and in feeling and in understanding. But it is quite otherwise with corporeal objects, for there is not one of them imaginable by, by me which my mind cannot easily divide into parts. This is sufficient to teach me that the mind or soul of man is entirely different from the body, a doctrine which s several centuries later was derided as the doctrine of the ghost in the machine by the philosopher Gilbert Ryle. The ghost in the machine uh, also has a great deal of moral and emotional appeal. Um, people don't like to think of themselves as glorified uh, gears and springs. Uh, because m machines are insensate, built to be used and disposable, whereas humans are sentient, possessing of dignity and rights, and precious, a notion that seems to come out of the doctrine that we have a soul that's separate from the mechanism of the body. Machines follow the ineluctable laws of physics, whereas behavior, we like to think, is freely chosen. With choice comes optimism about possibilities for the future, and with choice comes responsibility and the ability to hold other people accountable for their behavior. Uh, like the other two doctrines, the ghost in the machine has had a widespread influence. Freedom, dignity, and responsibility are often seen as incompatible with a biological view of the mind, which is commonly condemned as being reductionist or determinist. Now, no one really knows what these words mean, but everyone knows that they're something bad. 
And we see it even in, in uh, everyday thinking and speech, as when we talk about John's brain, which seems to presuppose some entity, John, that's separate from the brain that it owns. Uh, and when journalists speculate about brain transplants, whereas in fact they should really uh, discuss body transplants, because as the philosopher Dan Dennett once pointed out, this is the one such operation in which it's better to be the donor than the recipient. <laughs> Now, there's a big problem with a blank slate, um, and that is blank slates don't do anything. They would just sit there forever receiving inscriptions unless they had something uh, in, t in their organization that actively recombined the inscriptions on the slate and used them in pursuit of certain goals. No one denies the importance of learning, socialization, and culture. Only a madman would say everything is in the genes and that our experience doesn't count. The question, though, is what are we born with that allows us to learn and that allows experience to leave its trace on future uh, behavior? When Locke uh, said there is nothing in the intellect that was not first in the senses, I think the perfect reply came from Leibniz when he said, except for the intellect itself. Uh, and indeed, it's this recognition that has led to a number of threats to the blank slate from contemporary sciences that are studying the human mind. For example, my own field, cognitive science, has underscored that you need innate mechanisms to do the learning to begin with, and that these innate mechanisms uh, are complex and multiple. Evolutionary psychology has uh, challenged the blank slate by showing that beneath all of the cultural variation that anthropologists have trumpeted for the last hundred years, there's also a bedrock of universals, emotions and behavior patterns that are shared by all human beings uh, across the world's 6,000 cultures. Evolutionary psychology has undermined the blank slate in another way by showing that many human drives uh, can't be seen as ways in which people calculate what's best for them in their own day-to-day uh, -day lives, but rather can only be understood as adaptations to an ancestral environment in which we evolved, which may not be relevant to our happiness and well-being today. A thirst for revenge and a willingness to defend your interests with uh, violent defenses of one's honor uh, uh, lead to a great deal of unnecessary suffering, vendettas, blood feuds, uh, cycles of revenge, and so on, but were necessary in an, a world in which you couldn't dial 911 to get Leviathan to show up to settle your scores for you. And a reputation for toughness was one's own def only defense against being a uh, punching bag. And less obvious um, example is our desire for attractive mates. Now, a number of years ago, the humorist Fran Lebowitz made a very insightful observation about human psychology. She said, people who marry someone that they're attracted to are making a terrible mistake. You really should marry your best friend. You like your best friend more than you're likely to like anyone that you happen to be physically attracted to. You don't pick your best friend because they have a cute nose. But that's all you're doing when you're getting married. You're saying, I'm going to spend the rest of my life with you because of your lower lip. <laughs> now, this is a puzzle, and I th think the uh, solution to it is demonstrations that uh, many of the uh, anatomical signs of beauty are, in fact, uh, advertisements of health, fertility, and fitness. And in being attracted to people with that facial geometry, we're maximizing the chances that our genes will combine with the best uh, other genes. The noble savage has also uh, come under attack from uh, studies of, uh, of mind, brain, and behavior. Behavioral genetics has shown that among the traits that are heritable are antagonism, uh, unconscientiousness, tendencies towards violent crime and psychopathy. Neuroscience has identified brain mechanisms uh, in, among primates that are associated with aggression. Evolutionary psychology and anthropology have underscored the ubiquity of conflict in human societies, just as we see elsewhere in the animal kingdom. Now, what about our own society, where we enjoy this uh, relatively low uh, rate of death by violence? Well, um, here's a revealing question, and I'll, I'll pose it to you, and I beg you not to answer aloud, but keep the answer to yourself. H have you ever thought about killing someone? Okay, please don't answer. Well, psychologists are busybodies, and they have asked this question of large samples of people, and here's a typical result. 
Uh, about a third of men and 15% of women frequently think about killing people they don't like. <laughs> and about three quarters of men and more than 60% of women at least occasionally think about killing people they don't like. And many of you are probably thinking, yeah, and the rest are liars. <laughs> the ghost in the machine has also uh, come under uh, attack. Cognitive science has shown that intelligence uh, doesn't require some ghostly substance. Uh, it's not some act of magic, but it can be explained in mechanistic terms. That one can think of beliefs as a kind of information, thinking as a form of computation, not the kind of computation that your Macintosh does, but rather a form of presumably analog, uh, parallel, fuzzy computation, but computation nonetheless, and that emotions can be understood as mechanisms of feedback and control, uh, a little bit like your, uh, like your thermostat. Uh, neuroscience has undermined the ghost in the machine through what Francis Crick called the astonishing hypothesis in his book of, of that title, the hypothesis that all of our thoughts and feelings, all of our desires and joys and uh, aches and passions consist of the physiological activity of the tissues of the brain. And astonishing though this hypothesis may be, uh, there's a great deal of evidence that it's uh, true. We know that every form of mental activity gives off electrical signals that we can now detect, and moreover that by sending an electrical current into the brain, the person can undergo a vivid lifelike uh, experience. We know that the uh, brain is a, a, a chemical organ and that uh, administrations of chemicals, such as in uh, drugs, can change perception, thought, and uh, mood. Uh, in surgery, uh, if a surgeon severs the corpus callosum joining the two cerebral hemispheres, then you've got two consciousnesses taking place within one skull as if the soul could be bisected with a knife. Back here in studio with Will Baird, my colleague at the American Enterprise Institute. So we've heard from Steven Pinker now. He's presented his evidence and the literature on the various models of human nature, and, and Pinker presents his own uh, view, which is you know, probabilistic in many ways. Uh, he shows the difference between men and women in likelihood of wanting to kill someone that they are arguing with. That's a bit of an extreme example, but it does point to one of the major ramifications of the blank slate debate, which is sex differences, biological as opposed to socially constructed differences uh, between men and women. Now, what does uh, Pinker's conclusion lead you to say about such sex differences? And what do you think the political and social ramifications for major debates today might be? Yeah. So I think um, obviously one major conclusion that you would draw from the idea that humans are not a blank slate is that the differences we see between men and women are uh, most likely not primarily driven by socialization or teaching, and that it's, they are in large part due to uh, kind of the root biological difference, differences between men and women. You know, there are a number of differences at the chromosomal level, the hormonal level. Those impact, you know, the development of your body and your mind throughout puberty. Uh, and so those are going to have, you know, differences. Those are going to lead to other differences down the road in terms of how your behavior imp impacts, how you behave among other people, um, what professional path you take, um, what interests you in school, what interests you uh, in terms of your hobbies, your likes, dislikes, things like that. So one of the major issues and one of the reasons people may be defensive about the problems raised by sex differences and other forms of a not blank slate is the problem of difference and political equality. And Pinker, I think, is right to point to the Jeffersonian idea of equality and say it has nothing to do with, as he says, it is everything to do with all men are created equal and nothing to do with all men are created clones. We don't have to be identical in order to share in political equality. And for our more devoted listeners, you might recognize some of this uh, discussion from our podcast with Nicole Penn. Those who haven't listened to it should go back. Very fruitful discussion about that idea of equality. But Will, you offline raised a really interesting point to me about the way society ought to be being derived from the reality of the people who live within it and the differences among the people who live within it. Can we square that with Jeffersonian equality? Are we talking about some other realm entirely? Are we talking about equality in a different sense? I think it can absolutely be squared with Jeffersonian equality in terms of 
you know, political equality doesn't necessitate, you know, economic equality, doesn't necessitate uh, everyone being mentally the same. And in a way, you know, the entire, and Pinker references this, but the entire idea of having, uh, you know, a Republican form of government is that, you know, we, the same way we have these drives in, internally, indiv- individually, um, we have a drive that makes us want to be violent. We also have a drive that makes us want to be compassionate. Um, you know, those those drives, not those exact drives, but we have competing drives in the body politic. Ideally, the way a healthy republic works is by, you know, weighing those drives and determining which which is the most appropriate course of action for the society at that moment in time. So I think that not only do the idea that we have um, differences that are biologically rooted, not only does that not undermine the idea of Jeffersonian equality, it may even be a necessity for, you know, a healthy republican system. If we're all the same, why would we need republican government? Why would we need to vote? Or if we could all be made the same, why would all, not only would, why would we need to vote, but it would be possible for someone to just make us all the same and then alleviate any need to vote. There'd be no need to compete in, uh, in an adversarial political system. So I think, I think it's definitely uh, not intention and may even support um, Jefferson's ideals. So one more quick question before we send our listeners back to the lecture. You bring up republicanism and Pinker, again, one of his strengths is he says that he says democracy is actually the best way of setting up uh, a government that deals with human difference. And it's, you know, we men are not angels, so they need government and uh, ambition counteracts ambition, a rather Madisonian approach to the reality of human difference and governance. What this does point to, though, is a universality, right, a human nature that is conducive to republicanism, or at least that would best be served by republicanism. Can you read Pinker as saying that all people would best be served by a Republican form of government? Uh, I think you potentially could read Pinker as saying that. I don't necessarily think that is the outgro- a natural outgrowth of reading the evidence. You know, he mentions the kind of expanding circle of um, who we care about altruistically. And over time, you know, it's, a, it's moved from ourselves and our immediate kin to kind of bigger tribal groups, to the nation, to we care about everyone in the world. Um, and that is definitely something we've seen in the kind of – in psychology research. They call it weird societies, Western educated, industrialized, rich democracies. And so that's definitely been a trend in those societies. Uh, I don't know that we've seen it to the same extent in the rest of the world. And obviously weird societies are where we saw, um, you know, the revolutionary period where we saw the introduction of mass democracy. And so I think, I think it probably is an open question, the extent to which democracies can function well elsewhere. Obviously there are democracies in other parts of the world. Uh, They don't always function as well as ours. And that doesn't necessarily mean that dictatorship is good um, or that any other you know, form of government is preferable. But to the extent that a democracy or a republic functions well, it may in part be you know, due to the people themselves being people, a democratic people. Will and I will be back in just a few minutes for one last discussion on the blank slate, the modern denial of human nature. There's been widespread fear and loathing of uh, the sciences of human nature, both from the left and from the right. Uh, An example from the academic left is the famous manifesto against sociobiology um, authored by Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Lewontin and others. Uh, I'll give you a quote. The reason for the survival of these recurrent determinist theories is that they consistently tend to provide a genetic justification of the status quo and of existing privileges for certain groups according to class, race, or sex. These theories provided an important basis for the enactment of sterilization laws and also for the eugenics policies which led to the establishment of gas chambers in Nazi Germany. And partly because of this, uh, these accusations, E.O. Wilson, who the author of Sociobiology, was hounded by demonstrators uh, wherever he went to speak in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, Edward O. Wilson, so, come in here, Edward O. Wilson, sociobiologist and the prophet of right-wing patriarchy, and at the bottom of the poster it says, bring noisemakers. <laughs> but it isn't only the uh, left that's been upset, but also the religious and cultural right. For example, in the Weekly Standard, Andrew Ferguson wrote that biological theories of the mind are sure to give you the creeps, because whether a behavior is moral, whether it signifies virtue, is a judgment that the new science and materialism in general cannot make. And he contrasted biological theories with the Judeo-Christian view, according to which human beings are persons from the start, endowed with a soul, created by God, and infinitely precious. And this is the common understanding the new science means to undo. 
Uh, this is a, a widespread belief among the uh, political, religious, and cultural right. For example, the uh, Republican uh, majority whip Tom DeLay offered this, the following explanation for the horrific Columbine High School shootings uh, four years ago. He said that they were inevitable because our school systems teach children that they are nothing but glorified apes evolutionized out of some primordial soup of mud. And similarly, the U.S. House Judiciary Committee received the following testimony from a creationist uh, institute about the dangers of Darwinism. They cited the lyrics of the following rock song, You and me, baby, ain't nothing but mammals, so let's do it like they do it on the Discovery Channel. <laughs> Well, uh, where does the fear and loathing come from, and how might it be addressed? That's going to be the subject of the, the rest of this talk. Um, I'm going to suggest that, there are, uh, that these fears deserve to be taken seriously, and that they are four in number. The fear of inequality, the fear of imperfectibility, the fear of determinism, and the fear of nihilism. I'll explain each one. And I'll argue that all are based on non sequiturs. All come from the fact that these, this approach to human behavior is novel, not that they uh, really logically follow. And I'm going to go a bit farther and say that not only does uh, biological understanding of the mind not have the dangers that uh, it's been accused of, but in fact there are dangers in going in the opposite direction, in denying human nature. And what this means is that we should study human nature objectively without trying to put a moral thumb on either side of the scale. Well, let me start with a fear of inequality. This comes from a simple mathematical fact that zero equals zero. If we're blank slates, we must be equal. But if the mind has any innate organization, then different races, sexes, or individuals could be biologically different, and that would condone discrimination and oppression. Well, I think as soon as you see the fear stated uh, so clearly, you see the flaw in it. Namely, that fairness does not require a belief in sameness. When Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, he did not mean we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are clones. Uh, rather, uh, the, our commitment to political equality is a recognition of certain human interests that we assume to be universal across the species, uh, as it was written, that people are endowed with certain inalienable rights and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's also a commitment to, uh, as a policy, prohibiting discrimination against individuals based on the statistics of certain groups that they belong to, such as race, ethnicity, or sex. That is the core of fairness and equality of opportunity, and it has nothing to do with the factual question of whether people are, all people are biologically indistinguishable. Also, there's a downside of denying uh, the possibility of individual differences. Uh, many of the uh, most horrific cases of racial and ethnic persecution in the 20th century, in fact, did not come from uh, targeting groups that were thought to be racially inferior. Um, the problem is that if you believe that uh, all people are indistinguishable, there's a temptation to treat the more successful people not as more talented, but rather as more ruthless or avaricious. And many of the atrocities of the 20th century came from persecuting ethnic groups that provided the circumstances that allowed their more talented members to uh, prosper. Examples include the uh, Indians in East Africa and the South Pacific, the Chinese in Malaysia and Indonesia, the Igbos in Nigeria, and the Jews almost everywhere. Now, the second fear is the fear of imperfectibility the uh, dashing the age-old dream in the perfectibility of mankind. And it runs more or less as follows. If unpleasant traits are innate, selfishness, violence, prejudice, rape, that would make them unchangeable, so attempts at social reform and human improvement would be a waste of time. Why try to make the world a better place if people are rotten to the core and will just foul it up no matter what you do? Well, this too doesn't follow. Uh, the one reason is that ignoble motives do not automatically lead to ignoble behavior. And that's because the human mind is a complex system with many parts. And some parts can counteract others. So even if we did have innate temptations towards antisocial behavior, uh, we also have a, a moral sense, 
uh, cognitive abilities that allow us to learn the lessons of history, and executive systems of the frontal lobes that can uh, receive information from these subsystems and use them to control behavior. Um, indeed, the moral progress that we have enjoyed over the past few centuries didn't so much come from erasing or rewriting human nature as exploiting a certain part of it. The philosopher Peter Singer wrote a book called The Expanding Circle uh, based on the idea that uh, universally people have a sense of morality. That's the good news. Uh, unfortunately, the default setting is to apply it only to the members of your own clan or village or tribe but that social progress over the centuries consists of expanding that circle and deploying the sympathy that we instinctively feel towards our own family and friends to an ever-expanding uh, circle of uh, people. And there are also downsides in the belief of imperfectibility, and I'll mention three of them. One of them is totalitarian social engineering. If people are blank slates, well... The temptation is to say we damn well better control what gets written on those slates because if we don't do it, it will happen by uh, accident. And indeed, uh, many of the, um, the uh, most atrocious totalitarian regimes in the 20th century uh, overtly believed in the blank slate. And uh, much more benignly but still um, uh, troublesome – is a quote from uh, the city planner and architect Le Corbusier who said that city planners should begin with a clean tablecloth. We must build places where mankind will be reborn. A philosophy that's uh, sometimes called uh, authoritarian high modernism, the idea that we, could, we should redesign societies using, quote, scientific principles. Now, what does that mean in practice? His theory of human needs... Uh, as he described it, was that every human being needs so many cubic feet of air per minute to breathe, so many gallons of water for bathing, so many gallons of water for drinking, so many square feet for sleeping, and that was pretty much it. Uh, and that's what lead, led to his idea that cities should be designed for efficiency at meeting those needs uh, as opposed to the chaotic, uh, noisy, dirty jumble of cities like Paris that offended his sensibilities. Well, we now see uh, where he went wrong, um, that his theory of human nature was basically the, the blank slate. And he omitted uh, many other aspects of human nature, such as the need for intimate social in, uh, interaction in comfortable spaces, uh, the universal desire of humans to be um, in the presence of living things and green space, uh, human scale that makes people feel safe in dis dis defensible spaces, and so on. Um, another downside of perfectibility uh, is the a lack of appreciation for democracy. Many of the totalitarian regimes of the 20th, 20th century were led by idealistic, charismatic uh, leaders uh, who exerted a claim of moral superiority over their predecessors as a basis for their authority, uh, believed that their totalitarian state was just a temporary measure that uh, would eventually wither, leaving us in a, a state of uh, anarchism in which people would benignly cooperate and live in peace. In contrast, democracy is based on a rather jaundiced theory of human nature, the idea that people are permanently saddled with uh, a limits on their wisdom and foresight, and the mechanisms of checks and balances were explicitly intended as a way of counteracting the natural tendency among leaders towards uh, ambition and self-deception. Uh, the implications are that the intellect and personalities of children are shaped not by parents, but by a combination of factors, in part, although only in part, by genes, uh, in part by the surrounding culture, both the culture of the society as a whole and the children's own culture, which we call a peer group, and in part by chance, chance events in the wiring of the brain in utero in the first few years of life and perhaps chance experience. Now, I found that when people uh, hear these results, which are, uh, were first brought to the public attention by Judith Rich Harris uh, in her book, The Nurture Assumption, they often have the following reaction. So you're saying it doesn't matter how I treat my children. <laughs> now, uh, it's, it may be a natural reaction at first, but think about it. Uh, of course it matters how you treat your children. It's never okay to 
abuse uh, or belittle or neglect children because that's a terrible thing for a big, strong person to do to a small, helpless one who is under that person's care. Child-rearing, above all, is a moral responsibility. Let me more quickly go over the, the remaining two fears. The fear of determinism, determinism in the old philosophy sense as the opposite of free will, runs as follows. If behavior is caused by a person's biology, he can't be held responsible for it. Standards of responsibility, uh, credit, blame, reward, punishment, are themselves causes of behavior. These standards don't have to appeal to a ghost or an immaterial soul, but rather to certain parts of the brain, presumably concentrated in the prefrontal lobes, that can inhibit behavior. We can retain this influence on the brain systems for inhibition, namely holding people responsible, even as we come to understand the brain systems for temptation. Um, Also, the bogus defenses for bad behavior that have uh, made the news from our judicial system are, in fact, more likely to be environmental than biological uh, anyway. They include the abuse excuse with which the uh, Menendez brothers uh, got off the hook in their first trial by saying that the reason that they had to kill their parents is that they abused them when they were children. The black rage syndrome that the uh, radical lawyer William Kunstler proposed as a defense of the Long Island Railroad gunman who began shooting passengers at random. It was because of the stress of living in a racist society. And perhaps the the best example comes from uh, West Side Story in which the juvenile delinquents tell the local police sergeant, Dear kindly Sergeant Krupke, you got to understand, it's just our bringing up key that gets us out of hand. Our mothers all are junkies, our fathers all are drunks, Golly, Moses, naturally, were punks. (laughs) The final fear is the most nebulous. It's the fear of nihilism, the idea that biology strips life of all meaning and purpose. It says that love, beauty, and morality are just figments of a brain pursuing selfish evolutionary strategies. Uh, Although it's often a a fear expressed by uh, people with with, uh, certain religious beliefs, it's not just a uh, religious worry, but it's a secular worry as well. But I'll I'll discuss the religious version of this fear and the secular version separately. The religious version runs uh, uh, more or less as follows, that people need to believe in a soul which seeks to fulfill God's purpose and is rewarded or punished in an afterlife. Now, I, don't, I want to make it clear that I don't, I don't intend to argue uh, that, that uh, against religion or that people should not be religious uh, or that there's necessarily an incompatibility between religion and science. Uh, my goal is more defensive. I want to argue against the position that only religion uh, is, uh, can be the source of our uh, moral values. And and here's the response to that accusation uh, from religion. First of all, um, I don't see anything so um, ennobling about a belief in a life to come because it necessarily devalues life on earth. And think about what we conclude when we remind ourselves that life is short or what we do. We uh, renew a friendship. We uh, bury the hatchet in a, a silly dispute. We offer a gesture of affection Uh, We vow not to squander our time and to use it wisely. I would argue that nothing gives life more value than the realization that every moment of consciousness is a precious gift. Also, God's purpose sounds good in the abstract, but uh, in practice, it always seems to be conveyed by human beings, and that opens the door to uh, a great deal of mischief. Um, I'm going to... uh, Uh, Many of you uh, have seen the wonderful satirical newspaper called The Onion with its uh, mock news stories. And about a year ago, they ran the following headline, Hijackers Surprised to Find Selves in Hell. (laughs) We expected... We expected eternal paradise for this, say suicide bombers. Now, admittedly, this was criticized for being tasteless, and it is. Uh, But I think it does make an important point, Uh, uh, namely that, uh, yes, it may be true that without a belief in an afterlife, there might be some people who are uh, not deterred from uh, committing evil acts by the uh, threat of spending eternity in hell. But on the other hand, uh, they wouldn't be tempted to commit evil acts by the promise of spending eternity in heaven. Now, what about the secular version? Well, I think this is um, uh, nicely captured, and the flaws of it are are quite apparent. 
in uh, the opening scene of Annie Hall, in which the young Woody Allen, uh, seven years old, has been taken to the family doctor by his mother. The doctor says, uh, why are you depressed, Alvy? The mother answers for him. It's something he read. Something he read, huh? The universe is expanding. <laughs> the universe is expanding? Well, the universe is everything, and if it's expanding, someday it will break apart, and that would be the end of everything. His mother says, what is that your business? He stopped doing his homework. <laughs> and Alvy says, what's the point? <laughs> now, clearly Alvy has gone wrong here. And the reason, uh, I think, is beautifully pointed out by his mother, uh, frequently a, a source of wisdom, uh, who says to him, what has the universe got to do with it? You're here in Brooklyn. Brooklyn is not expanding. <laughs> Uh, indeed, Brooklyn is not expanding. The reason that we uh, that we laugh at this uh, the reason we laugh at this interchange is we realize that the young Woody Allen has confused two different levels of analysis: the human level, what is meaningful to us and how we want to live our lives today, given the brains that we have, and the causal level of how and why our brains uh, cause us to have those thoughts uh, to begin with. They're related, but they're not the same, and it's important not to confuse them. My final point is that um, morality uh, certainly is not a uh, a hallucination or a fiction invented by our brains, but there is an inherent logic in it that the human moral sense can be thought to implement. What this cartoon shows is the uh, inherent untenability of any system in which you would try to get other people to treat you in a manner different from the one that you are committed to treat other people. That logic the golden rule, if you will, is the core of morality, and it's no coincidence that it's been independently rediscovered by many of the world's religions and uh, great moral traditions. Back here in studio with Will Baird, we've just heard the the rest of Steven Pinker's lecture where he addresses what he calls the non-sequitur criticisms of the new materialism. And the criticism that he addresses from his right, he says is really a a multiplicity of criticisms. First, he cites Andy Ferguson writing in the Weekly Standard, who says that the new science and materialism cannot judge whether an act is moral or proper. And then he jumps to Republican congressmen saying that the natural outcome of teaching Darwinism in school is that kids will feel like they are dust and dirt and they'll commit massacres and there will be just widespread moral degradation. Now, those strike me as two different criticisms, one of which uh, seems to have a little bit more validity than the other. Uh, was was that your reading? Is that how you heard it as well? Yeah. So I, I think that definitely, as we said earlier, um, the is-ought distinction is a tough bridge to um, – it's a tough gap to bridge. What you, what, what you see about the world does not necessarily tell you anything about how the world ought to be, but we, we, have, to, we have nothing other than the way the world is to determine how the world ought to be. So we're kind of constantly struggling to determine what the ought is. And part of that's going to be based on what what we see around us. And part of that's going to be based on, um, you know, our own natural kind of biologically driven uh, inclinations towards, um, you know, our, our moral intuitions and the way we reason about uh, the ought. Uh, so in, insofar as, you know, someone is provided – the same way you can provide people with facts about the world – about any any facts about the world, right? You could provide people with facts about inequality, and without providing context into how markets work, uh, what we do to alleviate inequality, et cetera, the fact that there is inequality, economic inequality, doesn't tell you anything about uh, why it's there, how or why you might want to alleviate inequality, uh, whether you should attempt to it to, to do that, et cetera. And so, while it is possible to d- derive you know bad conclusions from this work, I don't I don't think that the facts themselves do not necessarily imply. Uh, a rejection of traditional morality any more that they, uh, you know, absolutely verify it. So I, maybe I'm just uh, inclined to defend Andy Ferguson because he's a wonderful writer. And uh, from our very brief encounter, he seems like a lovely man and everyone around Washington seems to think so. But all he said about the new science of materialism was that it should give people the creeps, not that he thought it was wrong. I don't, I don't think he rejects it. I think he just says that it gives you – it should give us the creeps. Does it give you the creeps? Does Pinker's lecture give you the creeps? Uh, no, it doesn't give me the creeps. Uh, I would say that all else being equal, more knowledge about the world is good. It allows us to better grapple with the world. 
without having a uh, sufficient understanding of the world, it's difficult to change it if you think the world is not how it ought to be. Uh, and so I don't think that it is necessarily... And another thing is that I think it is very modern to be skeptical of these sorts of arguments. Brian Kaplan, an economist at GMU, um, talks about how he has a theory, a pet theory, that uh, in a world where people only have one or two children, it's much harder to to see in day-to-day life how much uh, each ch- child is uh, different and a product of things that are not you know, driven by parenting or by their environment, and it's just who the child is. And I think that lacking that intuition, which I think used to be much more the case, you know, there's the saying, the apple doesn't fall from the, far from the tree. Um, it used to be much more a part of people's um, kind of common knowledge that people are like their family, people are like their parents, they're like their siblings. Um, and simply having this kind of biological explanation for why that's the case, it doesn't strike me as, as creepy at all. I want to address very briefly Pinker's discussion of religion and the role this science can play in replacing or elbowing out some of the the, the place in society that religion used to play. Uh, and one one thing he says, I don't think it was in passing, I think it's actually fairly central to the rejection of the notion, the uncomfortable rejection of the notion that the, the ghost can live in the machine, that there is some kind of dualism to who we are and there's a spirit that lives within our body. Right? He, he rejects that and says it, it can be very uncomfortable, uncomfortable for people to say there is no life after this life. And his defense of the lack of an afterlife in, in, his, in his world uh, is that the presence of an afterlife, the existence of an afterlife, will necessarily devalue the life that we have, this material life on Earth. Does that seem true to you? It, I, I'll, I'll tip my hand. It doesn't seem true to me. Yeah, I think, I think it depends on the nature of your conception of the afterlife. I mean, certainly he has that Onion article uh, about the terrorists who thought they were going to end up in heaven and were surprised they ended up in hell. So I think, I think it really depends on your conception of the afterlife and your conception of the afterlife's relation to this life. If you conceive of this life as only being in service of the afterlife, then I think it does necessarily devalue this life. Um, but if you see this life as having a certain inherent value, as well as the, an afterlife having inherent value, then I, I don't think that is the case. And he uses he does use the example of oh, well, when you think when you realize life is short, you reconnect to someone, you bury the hatchet. Um, when you realize life is short, you also say YOLO and do dumb things. Uh, so I think it, it really does depend bo- in both cases whether or not you think there's an afterlife or you think it's just this life. It really depends on what you consider to be the nature of the afterlife and of this life, um, which, of course, this evidence that Pinker discusses can provide an evidentiary basis but does not insel- itself you know, say anything about what is good in, in human society and human life. Will Baird, thank you for joining us and helping guide us through Stephen Pinker's lecture. Thank you, Tal. Thank you for listening to the Bradley Lectures podcast from the American Enterprise Institute. The Bradley Lectures were given for more than a quarter century at AEI thanks to the generous sponsorship of the Lyndon and Harry Bradley Foundation. AEI senior fellow Carlin Bowman and I hope you enjoy our revival of these lectures. If you do, please show your support by giving us a like and a comment and subscribing to our channel. And stay tuned for new episodes every other Monday as we bring the wisdom of the recent past to the most pressing issues of the present. Thanks for listening, and we hope you'll join us again next time on the Bradley Lectures Podcast.